For 79 years, Glaswegians have been traveling under their city. You didn't need to be a Glaswegian to take a pride in the underground, the only one in Britain outside London. Years of neglect took their toll. But cracks appeared in the station roof, and that was that. It's a unique system that I'll be very sorry to see, see go, but... The hoardings are evidence of the forthcoming modernization work. The modernized line reopened to the public on the 16th of April, 1918. The Glasgow subway is the third oldest underground rail system in Europe. The renowned map of the system forms its logo, a circle. This is one of the few metro systems to never be expanded from its original route. Originally opening in 1896, its visual identity comes from its four foot track gauge alongside its iconic orange color scheme. For a subway system with such heritage, its architecture on the surface has few historic stations. A series of modernization works stripped many of its surface level identity away. So what are the two distinct architectural styles of the system? And what is the future of this architecture? Where else to start an architectural tour than at the beautiful above ground entrance to St Enoch? This is one of the few stations on the network that has a distinctive standalone building remaining from the opening. Originally constructed as the ticket office, entrance and offices, the design of James Miller. Some say the design is Jacobean, some argue otherwise. However, whatever you call it, St Enoch is a monument to the subway itself. We will revisit this station later and understand how it has changed over the years following the modernization works. Buchanan Street is the next station we'll cover. Whilst Buchanan Street was in the center of a row of small shops, the subway entrance was part of the street scene and melded in with the surrounded buildings, something which can only really be seen elsewhere in the UK, in London. Next, I'm going to cover some of the standalone station buildings, such as West Street, Shields Road, and Bridge Street. These are all simple single-story buildings of varying architectural styles. The later two stood alone after slum clearances and motorway construction destroyed the communities these were built to serve. By 1977, the exterior of Bridge Street stood in a wasteland following demolition of all the buildings in the vicinity. And an old poster was a reminder of better times. Partick Cross, which later became Kelvin Hall, had a rather hidden away entrance. It was found down a side alley before venturing into this rundown building. This documentary captures its days prior to modernization. The subway depot at Govan was another part of the iconic architecture of the network. A distant view of the Broomlone Road depot leads to the workshops. This was built directly above the subway lines, with the only way to get trains in the depot was through a crane raising them. Meanwhile, up in the sheds, the ancient coaches are lifted out of the tunnels. Signage and wayfinding plays another important part of Metro Networks. The lack of wayfinding was an issue which plagued a number of stations. Hillhead Station had an entrance between two shops. However, its poor state of repair led to a loss of signage. By 1977, Hillhead was barely identifiable as a station entrance, most signing having disappeared. Therefore, an innocuous passageway led to the station below. The booking office was a very basic affair. 
Stairs led down to the island platform, which was fully enclosed and lit by a series of tungsten globes. Prior to the modernisation works, St George's Cross featured a modern entrance, constructed in 1971, featuring a brick exterior. The underground was due to close this Sunday, with a flourish. Half a million souvenir tickets had been printed for people wanting to say cheerio to the wee red trains. But cracks appeared in the station roof, and that was that. It was difficult to realise that one was looking at the same system. All stations were finished to a high quality with glazed tiles and wall lining. Following the 1977 closure, the poor state of the stations was identified as a key part of the modernisation programme. During the modernisation works, only one station was closed permanently. This was the Merkland Street station, likely because of the closure of industry on the riverfront, as well as the creation of the new Partick transport interchange. The only above ground station retained was St Enoch. The listed mock Jacobean surface building at St Enoch was placed on a raft and physically moved a few yards to make room for the new station. This became a travel information centre, now converted into a chain coffee shop. On my visit, this was stuck in the middle of a tacky Christmas market, which is no way to treat a city's heritage. Below ground, the whole of St Enoch was rebuilt, removing its narrow island platform. Other stations were rebuilt entirely, including Govan. Whilst a flaw of the network previously was its lack of signage and wayfinding, the approach to rebuilding stations above ground followed a similar material palette. The materials used on the exterior of stations here are dark bricks. Other improvements to the network were made, including the creation of a link between Buchanan Street Station and the Queen Street Mainline Station. Two passenger conveyors linked the underground with the British Rail Queen Street Concourse. A strange part of the rebuilding programme was the removal of all skylights from stations. Those stations which had been open to daylight were enclosed. It's not clear what the intentions were from this. Perhaps a method of reducing maintenance or antisocial behaviour. The result, however, makes many stations feel more claustrophobic than they previously appeared, with only the hum of electric lights to keep you company. The depot was kept in the same location, but partially rebuilt and incorporated a number of the old workshops. A new curve for trains to access this was actually incorporated, therefore removing the crane. Following an extensive restoration, including the rebuilding of multiple stations, the network formally reopened to passengers in April 1980. What previously was a system littered with rundown stations had a vibrant restoration with new facilities. However, some could argue the character of the system had been lost. Apart from its trains and narrow tunnels, this was now a lot more bland in design. Since 1990, renovation work has resulted in stations adopting individual colour schemes. This has helped develop a visual identity for the individual stations below ground. More modern works include St Enoch and Buchanan Street, have had covers placed on the escalators. This has helped improve the visual appearance of these, as well as the legibility of these as subway stations. Other modernisation works since the early 2000s and 2010s include the Partick station redeveloped as a transport hub, and also a Hillhead station has been modernised, including the retiling of walls and floors. However, no new stations have been built. This is the only subway network in the world to never be expanded. But there were plans, there were plenty of them. It's clear that there are two eras to the character of Glasgow's subway. The pre-modernisation architecture 
which is captured in this film. The post-modernization, where stations were rebuilt in a typical subway style with tiles and fluorescent lamps. But the question really is, is the post-modernization stuff worth saving? It's clear that the replacement brick buildings do have some charm. They offer a resemblance to Scandinavian modernism from the 1970s. Whilst design is subjective, I do feel there is some sensibility in the use of bricks in the designs. The benefits of its durability mean the stations still appear in good shape even after 50 years of use. But if the stations are to last as long as some of the originals, they are only at half the required lifespan. And the recent modernization of the network have through glazing into buildings in a generic fashion. This has eroded some of the 1970s character. Whilst I acknowledge the need to upgrade buildings, I feel Metro Network should have a distinctive architectural style and a material palette that assists in wayfinding. 